Hi, this is Dr. Emily Sterning with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in South Carolina. There are some serious challenges ahead in the forecast, but the more I looked at them, the more I think you can get on top of them. You're looking at less relative change in South Carolina than many states in the Southeast, and your Northern coast is remaining in kind of a sweet spot for tourism. Let's get into it. The first thing we're gonna look at is sea level rise because you might already guess what your big problem is in South Carolina. It's, it's water, water coming from the sea and water coming from the sky. But when you're talking about sea level rise for your state, in terms of direct inundation and property damage, it's just not as scary as I've seen further up the coast. Poor Delaware, they're looking at a rough ride anywhere around the Chesapeake. <sighs> Compared to that, it's smooth sailing for you, South Carolina. Let's take a look. First, I'm gonna show you why I'm gonna model the rise that I'm gonna model. For that, we're looking into the National Climate Assessment to see what Charleston is doing. We can see that Charleston is not planning just for 2050. All of their adaptation that they're doing is set for the year 2065. And based on a range of sea level rise estimates, they're going with 2.5 feet for critical infrastructure. All your public buildings, your hospitals, Right now, millions of dollars are being invested to get ready for a rise of 2.5 feet. Two, we think, is going to be a more reasonable high-end estimate, even considering current glacial melt data for 2050. And that's what we're going to look at for our forecast in NOAA's sea level rise viewer. You can check out the link in the video description if you want to go look right where you live. So here's the South Carolina coast of the current mean higher high water mark. I'm going to model this up to two feet of rise, and you're going to be alarmed by what it looks like from a uh, bird's eye view, right? 30,000 feet view. I promise you, when we get down into it, it's not too bad. So there's two feet of rise. Looks like big changes, right? We can see that up here by Myrtle Beach, there's kind of a barrier island feeling going on there, right? Like that looks a little more like the outer banks than it used to. But let's get in there and take a look at it, working north to south. We can see that many of these changes are expanding areas that were already very impacted by the sea. I'm not sure what you call them. We call them like a slough up uh, by where I live, where it's mostly water. And we can see that those slough areas are gonna be open ocean. But if we look down at the housing, we can see that there's more potential for flooding than there is now, but a lot of these areas that are green at two feet were already green at the current mean high or high water mark. They're low lying, they're marshy, they're going to stay pretty marshy by and large. Not a lot of direct damage to housing or infrastructure, just a need to become more resilient against flooding. And when we look down at the beach itself, we can see this very thin light blue line. That's how much of the beach will be lost, is that very thin light blue line at two feet. There will still be a lot of beach left to enjoy. This is a more modest beach loss forecast than I personally anticipated when I first began the South Carolina outlook. I think this is very hopeful, very much a forecast you can fight. Let's look down at Charleston, see what they're going to do as they're preparing for 2.5 feet of sea level rise. Here, let's pump it up to two feet of sea level rise. And we can see again, areas that were barriers for absorbing water are now going to be full. Like up here, we can see this area used to be mostly marshy, some open water. The margins for the open water are extending substantially up into this swamp, we're gonna have open water. But if we look down at the housing stock, there's much more expansion of areas that will flood, then there are uh, direct impacts to housing stock. You saw if we click on the high tide flooding that there's going to be a lot of places that are very vulnerable to high tide flooding, but that's not going to be a big surprise to anyone around here. That's a different ball game when you're talking about flooding risks than when we're talking about overall inundation. It's a forecast that you can fight. And you can see here that there's a lot of open water going to expand near agricultural areas. It's worth also taking into account that you're likely to see some soil degradation 
as fresh water sources become maybe contaminated with salt water and as salt moves into the ground. We'll talk a little bit more about soil health later. I wanna look down at the most challenging area of uh, South Carolina's coast, which is these beautiful sea islands, the beautiful sea island area here. We can see just on the map, it has the biggest changes from 30,000 feet. As we get further in, let's look at the current mean high or high water mark. We can see there's a lot of direct land loss here, isn't there? And that a lot of this land loss is in areas that are beautiful natural areas today, important for recreation and fishing and birds, of course, right? Look at that, the whole wildlife refuge practically is gonna be going underwater. So thinking about ways to create new habitat, to preserve habitat beyond what we have preserved is gonna be important for your future biodiversity. But again, we have some good news here. If we look into these populated islands, even at two feet, there's relatively little problems with direct destruction through sea level rise. Most of this housing stock is fine, even in these smaller communities. These are some of the most interesting smaller communities that I've seen in terms of resilience. You could get some real interesting community level projects taking place in this whole area that would transform your potential to remain in place through this century, remain in place in a healthy way. So there's a lot going on there with that sea level rise forecast but it's certainly not as bad as it could be. We're looking at more of a flooding and hurricane impact issue than a direct inundation issue. So there's a lot more we can do to prepare. We're losing the buffers, but there are ways that we can build up our buffers and our resilience to flooding. This is a situation with an outlook you can fight, but we do need to be prepared because on the hurricane front, and I know you've already been getting a preview of this with more inland storms, the types of tracks that are gonna be developing, they're very serious for South Carolina. Just a second, let me bring you back over to the National Climate Assessment. So here we can see the current GFDL and GFDA and hurricane models. And we can see that as we move through the 21st century, there's this new track emerging that's conserved in both of our major models, showing that it's gonna be very common for hurricanes and tropical storms to move directly inland up the coast over South Carolina's coasts. So the potential for flooding is enormous and we've already gotten a taste of that, right? I'm gonna show you this map. So this is looking at a 2015 event, right? 20, October, 2015, there was this extreme rainfall event related to a hurricane remnant where over four days, we got up to 26.9 inches of rain blowing away the thousand year estimates. And it wasn't just on the coast here, pretty far inland. We saw the thousand year estimates for rainfall blown away because we're entering a future that is markedly different from our past where high levels of inland rainfall are gonna be part of the new normal for which we need to get ready. The more we get ready now, the better prepared we are, the more we can weather these types of changes. Between sea rise and tropical rains, you can clearly see a big part of getting South Carolina ready for the changes as we move through this century is gonna be flood control, looking pretty far inland too. And as you can imagine, there are opportunities there within the industry. Flood control and flood mitigation are in demand now. Those industries are going to grow. If you're into controlling water or willing to do the cleanup, those are gonna be big services. They're a safe bet for investment whether you're talking time, energy, or cash. If we look here, let's go back to the federal report for a minute. I wanna show you how this is a little bit at odds with historical changes in heavy precipitation that we've been seeing. So looking here at changes in heavy precipitation since the 50s, we can see that a lot of South Carolina is shaded blue there in that area where we saw that huge rain impact in the 2015 flooding event, where we've got a, a net loss of heavy rains. This concerns me that you're being set up for a drought and deluge scenario, which can be very damaging to soil health, making me think that as we start looking at what's going on with the agricultural community, Soil preservation is gonna be critical for South Carolina's future success. 
I, I, more than most southeastern states, I hope you're getting ready to protect the soil to look out for water related soil erosion. If these big storms hit, particularly when the soil is dry, you can lose a lot if you don't have landscape barriers in place. In the upper Midwest, we've had a lot of success with the prairie strip method developed by Iowa State University, where you interlace natural habitat with the fields. You could do that with grassland or scrub, whatever is appropriate for your particular region. It'll help trap the soil, keep it in your fields. Terrain modification is also important. If you're on a slope, building in some more ridges and lips, it's gonna protect your soil for the next generation. Speaking of agriculture, if you've watched any of my other forecast videos for the Southeastern states, you've seen me talk about warm nights and how they can really have an impact on grain fill and pod fill for corn and soy. South Carolina knows more about those historically than other states. Let's take a look at the federal report again. So many of your Southeastern states historically didn't see any nights that stayed over 75, but South Carolina has seen them go pretty far inland historically. Maybe have a couple of weeks of them here in the center of the state, maybe have a month and a half of them here on the coast. We're gonna scroll down and we can see the projected number mid-century under RCP 4.5, which is kind of a market-driven reduced emission scenario. I think it's our most likely future. We can see that those warm nights are increasing dramatically for the state with this hot pocket here by the Southern coast looking at 75 to 100 warm nights and inland kind of 30 to 50 for much of the state little bit cooler by the mountains, some preservation of the nighttime cool as you get up into the foothills. So this is gonna have an impact on our power grid, but before we really go into analysis for that, let's also look at daytime temperatures. Let's look at the summer heat changes on the USDA heat map. So this map, it shows based on historical data from the 80s to 2009, how many days you get over 86. And we can see, that there um, used to be relative cool in the foothills of the mountains and down by Charleston with maybe 90 days over 86, much of the state having 120 up to days over 86 and up to 150 in this warm middle of the state. If we look towards uh, mid-century under that RCP 4.5, which I explain a little bit more of that in another video on my channel, we see pretty even heating here. This is not bad, about one month more of days over 86. Relative to many states in the nation, that is not an alarming forecast. There are some places that are seeing two or three month heat ups. That's gonna really shock a power grid. Between the one month heat up and the increase in warm nights, sure, South Carolina is gonna need a power grid tune up to handle the increased need for air conditioning, which isn't gonna be a luxury. Air conditioning is gonna be a public health necessity as we move through this century. But South Carolina is already built to handle a hot climate. Your most populated areas are the ones that have already dealt with the most warm nights. So I can see this projected increase in heat. It's not gonna excite anyone, but it's not near the top of your list of challenges as South Carolina gets ready for the future. We're not talking about a new problem. We're talking about a little increased scale on a problem you already have. While we're talking about temperature, Let's look over at the plant hardiness zones and see how your winter lows are gonna change. Right now, Charleston, based again on that historical data, is sitting pretty squarely in zone eight with some seven up near the mountains and some nine down by the coast. And that zone nine territory is interesting and valuable from an agricultural perspective and from a tourism perspective. That's like a subtropical climate that people like. And let's see what's gonna happen with that. Under RCP 4.5, as we move towards mid-century, we get a loss of our zone seven, except up by right at the edge of the mountains there, the very border, but we have a substantial expansion of that zone nine, moving almost up into Myrtle Beach. So this area is seeing some relative conservation in the climate, but it is getting a little more subtropical, and we have some subtropical spread all along the rest of the coast there. I don't think that that's a thing that anyone should be too negative about. It's nice, I think, when we look at the projected future for the rest of the world, which shows rough impacts on subtropical and tropical areas, the more of that that we're able to produce domestically in terms of subtropical and tropical crops, the better off we're gonna be without having to rely on imports. It's gonna be even more important in the future that the US can remain 
a major food exporter, crucial for global survival. But the more we can think about growing rather than importing, the better off we're gonna be. Big picture, South Carolina is looking at some real challenges, but the most serious are all around flooding. Anyone who's experienced serious flooding, including me, I, we know how much trouble that can be, both emotionally and physically, it's very taxing. But South Carolina is working on the flooding problem, spending millions of dollars in the major cities to get on top of it, using what still look like pretty solid estimates for future risks. If the cities can get that done, if the state can get the grid tuned up, this state will see less relative change than many. You're talking about shifting towards a northern Florida type climate, which is a climate many people enjoy. You've got good landscape models for what your changing plant communities might look like as you get into that zone nine heat up. And let's be honest, those plant communities look pretty good. People like them. There's a lot of potential for growth in many of your state's vibrant tourism areas, what with your limited beach loss and this continued developing subtropical climate. Inland, that's where you might need to make some more changes. You might have to change up your agricultural products to avoid a real loss in productivity. Right now, South Carolina has a lot of animal production. I saw turkeys, broilers, cows, and calves all near the top of your lists. They're, those are all going to require more cooling in the future, making the operations more expensive. There are hot weather table crops that might be successful in your climate, particularly as we look at needing to move table crop production out of the Southwest, where water is a catastrophically limiting resource in almost every projection. In a water rich state like yours, there's a lot of potential for future agricultural growth. Right now, the projections on the federal level show a net ag loss for your state, but that's because it's gonna to get too hot for corn and soy where you live. If you're willing to change things up, you could defy the federal expectations. Wrapping it up, I would say that South Carolina is looking at strong resilience potential, but you know, a lot of the projects you need, big flood control projects, those are for communities. They're community level projects. They're not home level projects. For flood control, you gotta to get together around it. You gotta make a good plan that takes into account the well-being of your neighbors. You don't wanna just dump flood water on them. You've gotta to work together. Strong communities are at the heart of resilience. We're gonna see that for sure in South Carolina. So if you don't know how to get started getting ready for the future, get more involved with your community. The more people you know, the closer you are with your neighbors, the better you're gonna be able to get the energy to build resilience going. We need to work together to get ready. This is Dr. Scherning with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe, help get the message out there. There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.